All right, we're going to dive back in. Um, part two of last week, I'm going to cover a little bit of where, where we came from just to get started. But I'll go through this fairly quickly. And then uh, we're going to watch the transmission and development of theological expression about the sun as false teachings came up and as the church is working through those. So we're actually going to see handoffs through that process because that's what this course is about sacred stewardship, the passing the baton of the truce down through the history of the church. And uh, so we'll hit there. We'll, we'll go back on a few of the things we talked about last week. And by the way, Matt, you'll be pleased to know that I did try and identify geographical locations where those heresies were at. So I did do a little research on Christophanes. Um, don't know that I learned a lot more. But I did a little research on that, too. So, um, And then uh, Matt asked me a question after class about, is there eternal subordination among the persons? There's obviously not, there's obviously not uh, subordination of their nature, because there's only one, God, one nature. But because there's a father and a son, there's implications to that language. But... Are they truly subordinate? And uh, so I dug out a book that I haven't touched yet at home. So I'm going to do some reading on that. And perhaps in a couple of weeks, we'll have a conversation about that. Not tonight. What's that? Yeah, a few of them. Yeah. Uh, but I'm prompted now because I really haven't studied that very carefully. And so I've got a book that's uh, different from my view which is going to help me to be able to think about it more. So anyway, um, so there's a little bit of my life. <laughs> but thank you for giving me uh, things that I, that I can study better. I appreciate those questions. So I can legitimately say in front of you, I'm not sure, here's what I think, but I'm going to go study it some more. Um, so uh, here's the essential truth about God the Son. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. So that's from the Nicene Constantinople and Creed, 381. As that era, they developed a little bit more from the Nicene Creed based on discussions that went out and arguments that went on throughout the fourth century. Um, so there's more work done on, on the Creed. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Three things that we're talking about when we look at the essential truths. One is, what does the Bible say about it? What does God disclose about the Bible? Uh, how do we carefully express it, those truths in the scripture, uh, to be faithful to it and carefully express it? And as we go through the hand downs, you'll see that the work that the church is doing, uh, prompted a lot by false teachings is to get those expressions, um, do them very carefully so that they re reflect the truths of Scripture and they help guard the church against things that are being said outside the church and sometimes even inside the church that aren't true. And then practical implications, we'll hit that at the end. <coughs> Assuming that uh, we fi actually finish this in part two tonight, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I gave you a few... Uh, uh, indicators of how you can how the sun is revealed in the grand narrative of Scripture. So, um, in the Old Testament, in the early narrative, in the prophets, um, a lot of a lot of um, prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, and um, and indicators in the language, indicators in the in the prophet prophecies of uh, of God, uh, the Son becoming incarnate not just a human Messiah, but truly um, uh, the Lord. Proclaiming and pointing to the incarnate Son by John the Baptist, John tells right away, he, he identifies who he is, identifies his divine nature in, in John. We looked at that last week, some passages. And then, um, and then God the Son, Jesus Christ's own declarations and own demonstrations about himself to make it clear who he was. Um, for, and for those that believed, uh, they came to believe that and confess that. We've talked a lot about John's gospel, John chapter one, 
And then John 20 at the end where he says, if you're reading this, you should know. His goal is for you to know and believe that he is uh, God the Son. And then uh, uh, by gospel writers, those times when in, in the narration and attestation of fulfillments, they make lots of references. Matthew particularly makes lots of references to this is exactly what was prophesied and cites the prophecies in the Old Testament. And then finally, and this is what we're going to talk about mostly tonight, confirmation and confession throughout the apostolic teachings and, teachings and writings continued by the church. That's what we're going to see. Where did the church go from um, what, was, uh, what the apostles taught and wrote um, in the scriptures? So I'll start with, I think I, I gave you this, these quotes last time for Irenaeus. Irenaeus is second century, um, and he's got a legacy tracing back to an apostle. We'll see that in a few minutes. We'll kind of see that trail. Um, and he wrote um, something called Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching, and it was to tell his friend how to read the scriptures um, how to go through the scriptures. Um, and he unfolds uh, the gospel. He unfolds the revelation of the, of the Father, Son, and the Spirit through the gospel. Um, and he's doing that in the context of he's been addressing heresies. And so this is to help someone, help a believer. He starts with a friend, help them to be able to read the scriptures, knowing the truth from the scriptures, uh, of the Father, the Son, the Spirit, knowing the truth about, um, about uh, um, and how to, how to read and understand the truth in the Scriptures. So, by the invocation of the name of Jesus Christ, when it's said, uh, crucified under Pont Pontius Pilate, there's a separation and division among mankind, those that believe and those that reject it. Uh, that's what he saw in his day. Uh, and it, wheresoever any of those who believe on him shall invoke and call upon him and do his will, he is near and present, fulfilling the request of those who with pure hearts call on him. Because that's what Jesus said he would do. Um, and then as he's wrapping up this, uh, this work on how to read uh, the narrative of Scripture, how to read as the apostles taught, uh, this, beloved, is the preaching of the truth, and this is the manner of our redemption, and this is the way of life, which the prophets proclaimed, and Christ established, and the apostles delivered, and the church and all the world hands on to her children. So there's the passing down that he said is happening in his day. And he makes a claim in his work against the heresies that if you go to a church no matter where you go in the, in the Roman Empire, if you go to a church, you'll hear this being taught. He's refuting the heresies by saying the church is consistent because the heresies, especially the Gnostic heresies, there were all kinds of different, different ways that they taught it. Um, there was a lot of disagreement on what it meant. They were all trying to make a theological point, but because there's so many differences, he can say, listen, look at that. They don't even agree with each other, uh, but the true church does. Um, this we must keep with all certainty. So that's, the, that's his press to his friend plus the church. We've got to maintain this truth. We've got to stay true to what the scriptures say, to what the apostles taught, um, with a sound will and pleasing to God, with good works and a right-willed disposition. So his, just a little snapshot of how foundational biblical truth is um, for the church. So here's how at least the earlier church kind of practiced this navigation from the apostles, because there's no apostles around. Uh, so you read the scriptures, and he and others will say, you read it with a pure mind uh, through the Holy Spirit. And what they believe is to encourage Christians in the churches is if you read with a pure mind, you'll clearly see what we're teaching. You'll see that that's truth. Um, and they'll counter that argument with all these novel false teachings because they're not doing that. 
Oh yeah, they're reading the scriptures, but they're not reading it with a pure mind. Uh, they're reading it with false influences, false agendas. The rule of truth, that's the apostolic, uh, apostolic transmission, what the apostles handed down in their teaching. And then working together. No one does this on their own because what's happening with, and I'll point to the Gnostics, what's happening is that individual is teaching this. Well, that individual is teaching something different. Well, that individual is teaching, they're coming up with this on, on their own and trying to pass it down. But that's not the church. Um, and in doing that, they're working to, uh, to address those errors and make careful right expression of the truth, right? Is that what we do today? Do we do that today? Are we, are we uh, collegial? Just think, about the, just think about Christianity today. Um, are we collegial when we, when we uh, work through? Yeah. You kind of asked a question like that last week. You asked about someone who's, who's uh, when they read the scriptures, they say, well, I, I have my own understanding that. Um, and so I thought about that question. I don't know if I answered it very well last week, but, uh, but that can characterize the church today. Um, and it's challenging when you, if you disagree on the essentials, that's a, that's a challenge. But when you get beyond the essentials um, and you have disagreements about things that, that you're convicted about are the truths of scriptures, and usually there's a camp with you, um, can you have collegiality when you have those differences in how you read scripture? That's what uh, Irenaeus would have said. We're going to hear about a fellow named Tertullian. That's what he would have said. Uh, that's what Athanasius said. Um, and sometimes they'd say just they'd say more than that. They would say more than they didn't have a pure mind. They have a Satan influenced mind. Right. It's not like a character assassination instead of yeah. Somebody over here jumps up and starts babbling and running around and back and forth. That is not the Holy Spirit. I mean, Paul, that is a different kind of spirit. And so I've had problems with if you allow that in your church, then, then how much of what you believe is actually spirit led and how much is not? Because our God is not a God of chaos. Right. Paul pointed out. That don't have someone to interpret what they're saying. Let them be silent. So for that very reason. How come it's so hard for a group of people to get together and talk in a nice way about the differences? <laughs> <laughs> well, what they started forming was councils, and we'll see that. That's where the, where the that's where the creeds come come from. For example, so there would be synods, and then larger councils, and they would work on on addressing these false false truths. They weren't always very uh, polite to one another as well in those councils. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but- It's not character assassination called sin of sin. That's true, it's not. <laughs> well, it's certainly something to be thinking about when you look at um, our culture today, the, the, um, the nature of, of the church, um, and all of us have a responsibility, yes, to, 
to confess the essential truths, to grow in our understanding of them. All of us have a responsibility to, to, to be aware of what's being said that's not true. Um, I mean, in your home, you want that, right? You want to teach straight truth to your family and then be aware of things that they're going to be hearing about and help them to understand those things. Um, Need to be yeah. Because if they're not, then you quickly step out of bounds and you go off the tracks. False teachings have been here since the beginning. Um, yeah, and and it's not simply somebody intending to have a false teaching because they're convicted about it. It can also be something that just oh. I'm reading, hey, I just thought of something. And you start to formulate, not with ill, Ill intent, but you start to formulate a, this has got to be the truth. Um, well, but this is what you've been, this is what you've learned and been taught and what's been handed down throughout history. So you're going to say now you've got a new idea that's completely different than, than uh, what the church has always believed. And that happens. Yep. Um, so anyway, just planting that little seed as we walk through the stepping down and see what happened uh, about um, God the Son, incarnate human flesh, um, and how the church um, addressed um, the teachings that were happening that were didn't believe that th what that's what the scripture said. So here's John, here's John the Apostle, First uh, John four, and John brings up something that's happening in that day. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay, he's seeing it. Um, it's not just historical, but he's seeing it happen in his day, because Christ has come. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus as the Christ, who has come in the flesh, is from God. Um, the truth that you should hear and you should profess is that. Jesus is the Christ who has come into the flesh, is from God. Remember, this is the same John who wrote John's Gospel, same John who wrote John 1, um, as he, as he uh, exploded that in the beginning of his Gospel. And he's warning his readers that not everybody is saying that. Some are saying that he did not come in the flesh. Um, and we're going to see those heresies in just a second. But every spirit that refuses to confess Jesus, that spirit is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist against Christ, which you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. So here's John, right? Late first century, writing this letter and saying, it's already happened. It's here. There are those who refuse to believe what I wrote my gospel about, what we've been witnessing, what we've been t testifying to. Uh, you are from God, little children, have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world's perspective and the world listens to them. We are from God. The person who knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit. Okay, you'll see something in, in those last few verses, which is going to be something that's argued by those who come after John. Because they're going to say, where did that teaching come from? It did not come from the spirit. It did not come from the spirit. It did not come from what the apostles taught. It did not come from what was handed down to us. So it must be from, because they're convicted about it, it must be from the world. And many are going to say, that's the influence of Satan. They're going to write that. They're going to clearly say, that's where it's coming from. Um, so we'll go back to the major false teachings we covered briefly last week. 
is Jesus God or is he man, simply human? God appearing to be a man or just a man? Um, those are the first ones. So we talked about docetism. Uh, this is a, um, a form of Gnosticism. And so those who advocated docetism uh, late first century, uh, and a lot of these were coming out of Rome because Rome was where, where these things were landing and then being widespread from there. So they thought that the, uh, um, the physical world is corrupt and there's no way that God would take on human flesh because he would be corrupt by that. Um, so Christ only appeared to have a human body. Did that come out of Gnosticism or did Gnosticism come out of this thing? Or, or just... This was a stream of Gnosticism. Right? So that's late first century. Um, and then Marcionism, so this is another form of Gnosticism. Second century through third century, this, this was, uh, became very prominent and widespread. Marcion was the teacher of it, so that's how it got the title. Um, so Marcion ends up in Rome. Uh, he's got a, a teacher uh, that he's listening to, and he starts formulating this theology that's a little bit different than, Nos than Docetism. He believes that, the, that there's two different gods. There's God, the flawed God who created, and there's God, the higher God, the good God. Um, and you see that when you read the Bible. So in the Old, Old Testament, you see this God who's judgmental, this God who kills people. Um, and in the New Testament, you see God who's loving, gracious, spiritual, and he's the one who sent his son to be the savior. Um, Well, yeah. Not quite, but uh, um, so he's 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 dissecting scripture to, to come up to to come up with this and and defend it. So there's a higher God who's the true God. He's the one who sends this uh, creator, but that's a corrupt God. Um, and that's the one that creates. Um, and so to redeem, he sends his son. But it's not a redemption through his, um, through his death. It's a, it's a redemption of the principle of truth and law because it's going to be a spiritual salvation, not a physical salvation. Um, so this is second and third century Rome is where it starts and the movement became widespread. So Irenaeus is addressing all these as he's writing. He's, he's going after all these. Um, and Marcionism, there's another fellow that went after him too uh, because it was, it was getting pervasive. Would you kind of say that Marcionism might have been somebody's attempt to explain why bad things happened in the 15th Well, I mean, God. Yeah. yeah. One of the one of the premises was, hey, there's absolutely nothing that you can do about the fact that your you that your uh, uh, behavior is is sinful. What you need to do is understand that what really matters in the end is the spiritual world. So denial of you know the resurrection where you're recreated, the spiritual world because matter is bad, spirit good. So at the end of the day, and this was the really dangerous thing, or one of the dangerous things, it doesn't really matter how you live um, because that's going to be gone. The, the good God sent his son so that you would have access to the spiritual world that you're going to be in later. I'm, I'm kind of really condensing and summarizing. It's a little bit more complex than that, but... Uh, um, so the Ebionites, um, Jesus was a normal man, born to Mary and Joseph, so he's not uh, God. Um, and this was, 
the Ebionites were, um, were identifiable with the poor people. This, that's what it meant. So these were groups in Palestine, second century. They wrote their own gospel. Uh, it read sort of like Matthew's gospel, although the birth narrative is not in there because um, Jesus is just the son of Joseph and Mary. Um, but it's the life that he lived that is emulatable. Um, and so uh, their press was for, um, in fact, their writings got, you can't even find their writings. They got done away with. So everything that we know about it was written by those who knew and captured this at, at that time. Uh, so not God, normal human being, normal man. Yeah. But there's a, four, a few different groups who caught on to this and they decided, hey, we're going to, um, we're going to write a, we're going to write a gospel, our own gospel. So it's um, a form of divinity without the divinity? <laughs> not divinity. Just a good example. Yeah. Um, but with this next one, there is divinity. So, um, but the Ebionites, so they're, I mean, think about the day, right? So they've heard about Jesus. They know about Jesus. They're in Palestine. Uh, there's groups that are very familiar with him. And so they're trying to write what they believe is a legitimate story about him. Um, because they don't, they don't uh, affirm um, the, uh, the incarnate birth. They don't affirm that he's God the Son in human flesh. They don't affirm any of that. Um, so they're creating their own gospel based on what they know about him, what they've heard about him. I was going to say what they have talked to people who have seen, but they left out everything that was unverifiable as far as his birth. Yeah, could have. Again, we don't have the full story of how they did it. Um, and then finally, adoptionism. So Jesus was a mere man, so no virgin birth, no, no birth by the Spirit, but whom the divine Christ, so... Um, or spirit descended upon him at baptism or so at some point. And some just argue that he prog he progressed in his power and knowledge because of his life. So so eventually he becomes divine like. Um, acknowledged to be by the Father to be his son. So the statements in scripture about this is my son in whom I'm well pleased at the baptism. Or later, this is my son, the transfiguration. So at some point they say those testimonies affirm that God the Father is adopting him. Um, some will say investing him with deity. Um, and that was large in the second century. So you can see what's happening here too is even though, even though um, by this point the scriptures have been written, there's other gospels being written. There's other accounts of Jesus being written um, with conviction that this is, this is the true gospel, not the ones that were written by uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, not what the apostles wrote. In fact, Marcion, um, he decided to discard the entire Bible except the epistles of Paul and his version of Luke. So he edits Luke's gospel, and that's the Bible. That's his canon that he declares. So um, here's a church. How do they respond to this? How do they deal with um, all these false explanations of who Jesus is, these false truths about who Jesus is? Well, you've got Polycarp. Um, he was in the, uh, the mid to late, or mid, middle second centuries when he's doing his writing. Uh, and Polycarp, guess what? He was taught by John. John the Apostle, John the writer of John's Gospel, John the writer of letters. And you see this by how he writes. So he's addressing um, the, the false teaching that's happening in his time, the Caesar becoming pre prevalent. And he says this, For everyone who does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is the Antichrist, where did that come from? We just read it, 1 John. He's quoting 1 John. So he's seeing it in his day. And he's, 
he's reflecting what John taught him, what he learned from John. Here's the handing down. Here's the transmission that's happening in that next uh, next century, next generation, right? Because John's gone. Um, and whoever does not acknowledge the testimony of that of that cross of of the cross, uh, my bad writing, uh, is of the devil. And whoever twists the sayings of the Lord to suit his own sinful desires and claims there is neither resurrection nor judgment, well, that person is the firstborn of Satan. So see how he's carrying on with how John has been, ha, ha, what they said about them? Polycarp's being, and he's on his way to martyrdom, by the way. Um, there's only, this is the only uh, letter that we have of him that's been affirmed to be, okay, this was truly what he wrote. Um, to his own uh, uh, firstborn of Satan. Therefore, let us leave behind the worthless speculation of the crowd and their false teachings. So that's the, this comes from the world, you know, as John said, and let's return to the word delivered to us from the beginning. That which the apostles gave us, that which they taught us. Let's go back to that. Um, then we have Irenaeus. Well, John taught Irenaeus, or John taught Polycarp. Polycarp taught Irenaeus. So Irenaeus says in his Against the Heresies, he declares it to those who are reading his account of the heresies. He says, you know that what I'm saying is true, because he's really writing it to believers. The heretics aren't going to read it, but he's trying to help the church. He says, you know what I said is true because... I learned from Polycarp, and he learned from John. I'm just writing and teaching what was handed down to me against these novel ideas that people are coming up with. And oh, by the way, they come up with new, new one every other day. So he says, the second point is the Word of God, the Son of God, Christ Jesus our Lord, who is manifested to the prophets according to the form of their prophesying and according to the method and dispensation of the Father, through whom all things were made, who also at the end of times to complete and gather up all things was made man among men. So through Christ the world was made. Now his work when he's come has been to, um, uh, to uh, redeem, redeem man uh, through his incarnation, through his um, crucifixion, through his resurrection, visible and tangible. Well, that's what John wrote. I didn't see it, but he did. Um, in order to abolish death and show forth life and produce a community of union between God and man, he bridged the gap that was unbridgeable between a holy God and sinful humanity. So um, these early expressions, you see they're developing. They're developing clearer and clearer exp expressions of God the Son as they are, are provoked by these heresies and they're trying to be faithful in handing down the truth. Uh, so you've, and you've got the legacy. You've got John to Polycarp to Irenaeus. So next major category of false teachings is, is he fully God? Um, and so we talked about this before uh, but modalism or Sabellianism, that's one form of, of modalism. Um, the Son is a manifestation of God the Father, not a distinct divine person. So this has been carried on for a long time through church history. Second century Rome, Sabellius. Sabellius was the one who said um, that uh, he appears the Father, then the Son, then the Spirit. There's no divine distinct persons. Um, fourth century, it popped up in Libya. Uh, 16th century in Spain through Servetus, uh, who, who defended this in his way. 18th century in Sweden by Swedenborg. That was the name of the individual. So he got kind of named after the country or the territory at that time, uh, this argument. And... 
We'll see how that got dressed in just a second. And then Arianism, so fourth century. So we're going through, gone through uh, second century, third century, fourth century. There was a time when the sun was not. The sun was created by God before the rest of creation, outside of creation history. Therefore, he is a deity, but not like God, because he's not of the same divine nature, because he was created by God. And so, and he also doesn't have true knowledge of God, because um, he doesn't, can't understand the eternal God. So, but he's a deity. Um, and this is fourth century, Arius in Alexandria. That's where it got started. Um, major, major, um, one of the major, major centers of the church because there were a lot of churches underneath um, the Alexandria bonnet, if you will. Hmm? Egypt. Yep. Northern Egypt, yeah. Or Northern Africa. Africa. Yeah. So here's Tertullian. Uh, he was just a few years after Irenaeus, but he's going to address modalism. Uh, he writes this accusation against Praxius. Praxius was a confessed modalist. Um, and he, Tertullian uh, accused him by saying, one cannot believe, here, here's what, here's what uh, Praxius believes, one cannot believe in only one God in any other way that by saying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are the very self-same person. So you have, that's what, that's his accusation against uh, Praxius, um, who's in the church, who's trying to teach this to the church. This is what he believes. Um, and he's using scripture to defend his case. And here's what he says against Praxis. In various ways, the devil reviled truth. Has a devil reviled truth. There you go again, just like you saw with Polycarp. He's accusing um, Praxis' teaching is coming from Satan. Sometimes his aim has been to destroy it by defending it. He maintains there's only one Lord, the Almighty creator of the world, and that the doctrine of the unity, he may fabricate a heresy. Didn't you say something earlier today about people can say the truth? Um, I was thinking about in theology lines, they can say things are true. Well, you were talking about the truth about people having sinned. But this argument for Tertullian is saying he's doing what Satan would do. He's taking something that is true from Scripture, but it's not true because it, it doesn't declare um, the, uh, uh, the divine persons of the Godhead. So he's saying, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to use Praxis to twist this, say there is one God, and guess what? A lot of people tried to defend that because so convicted that there's only one God, they're trying to defend that. He maintains there's only one, one uh, there's doctrine you may be fabricated heresy. He says that the Father himself came down into the Virgin, was himself born of her, himself suffered, indeed was himself Jesus Christ. And he says, Praxis did two pieces of the devil's work in Rome. He drove out prophecy and brought in heresy. So denying all the prophecy about the coming of Christ, um, all the prophecy that was fulfilled when Christ came, or when the, incarnate, the, the Son came, became incarnate. He put to flight the paraclete, and he crucified the Father. So no Holy Spirit uh, indwelling the church because it's, you know, it's the, it's the one God. Um, Holy Spirit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mentioned some of the prophecies about Jesus, you know, he'll be Bethlehem or whatever, but he calls it, you know, he said, as it was written, he called him Nazarene, and that's not really, that's not an Old Testament prophecy that we know of. So, do you know, is there any speculation as to where Matthew got that? It would be a Nazarene from Seth, Seth, I don't know. I'm going to have to look at that one. Yeah. Um, there's, there's two two common. Uh, yeah. One Nazarene is very close to the root word for uh, in Hebrew branch is uh, 
uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's that idea. Um, there's also an idea um, that Nazarene, uh, Nazareth was just very lowly. Uh, right. Or called a disrespected, uh, what good can come from Nazareth. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Old, uh, you know, Isaiah, um, and you know, would be despised, rejected, uh, scorned. Um, you know, you would be uh, nothing, nothing special to look at. So yeah. To say that he would be called the Nazarene would, would just be saying he would be lonely and rejected and despised. Yeah. 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 Good. Thanks. Hmm. The second Jesus action, I can see that where we just use common expressions to denote somebody, right? Like he's an man. Yeah. Yeah. What's <laughs> that? Yeah. Fortunately, I'm not from Texas, so I don't have to worry about this. <laughs> but you live in Texas now. I do. Temporarily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So because sometimes we hear like um, examples of the Trinity of like people, you know, the ice example and the water and the, and then the clover and stuff. So like and growing up, you're like, people are just trying to explain trying their best to explain yeah. you know the Trinity and these people might be doing the same thing so if someone does if, if we're wrong on these you know knowing exactly what the Trinity understanding the Trinity does mm-hmm. that mean that we're a person is not saved is that a necessary thing to be saved um, well it's um, it's not necessary for salvation to be able to confess the Trinity to truly confess it. Um, in fact, um, it's not uncommon where someone's given a testimony about their, like a baptismal testimony, and they'll say something which you go, well, that's not quite, but that's just, that's just not understanding yet. In fact, that's why the church invested. So as they're developing, uh, as they're developing these, these defenses against false teachings, and as they're writing creeds, those are instructive. So you're spending time with, with uh, brand new believers, teaching them about the truths of the faith, and especially in this day, especially about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They believe that's necessary for them to understand their salvation. Uh, they believe it's necessary so they won't get drawn away by these false teachings. Go, you know, that sounds pretty reasonable. Um, and so, uh, so there's a process of discipling, which is teaching them the truth about God. Truth about the Trinity. Um, the other side of that is, while people can come up with examples that they think it's are, that's a reasonable example. They're not, um, and the uh, the danger in that is that so many heresies try and break the tension. Um, so how can well, yeah, that too. But they're also trying to, heresies usually are a, are a, 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 a breaking the tension. So um, we can't, no one can understand um, one God, three persons. Nobody can. We can confess it. We can work out to some extent the logic, but we can't fully understand it. So if you say, okay, like the modalist, um, no, there's only one God. So must be that um, they, God just appears this way. What have you done? You tried to break the tension, right? You've, you've reasoned your way to breaking the tension to be able to say, that makes sense. That's reasonable. That's a reasonable explanation of who God is. So modalism does that. Um, the earlier heresies we saw, they're doing a similar thing. They're trying to break the tension in the truth, or they're just coming up with a way on, on, on their own resources to go, all right, let's let's figure out who this, who this Jesus is. Uh, let's write about him, and um, and that's our conviction. So, does that help? Yeah, but the uh, um, I am not an advocate of using eggs, apples, um, 
yardsticks. Um, yeah, because yeah, because that's not that's not the Trinity. Yeah. Because there's nothing finite on earth that can describe this perfectly. So where does it fall short? And so we had fun going hunt for that theology of why is this not a great answer? And yeah. anything you teach them, we don't want to teach them something we have to unteach them. So. Persons, not parts. Always persons, not parts. Yeah. So that's a problem with like the egg and things because you've got. You've got the yolk, the white, and the shell. Well, those, those are parts of the egg. No part of that is completely egg, right? But the Son is fully God. So he's not the white. The Holy Spirit's fully God. He's not the yolk, et cetera. So, okay, how are we doing? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. What's that? It's net net zero. Ah, okay. Okay. You looked it up? Uh, no, I just remembered it. Good for you. Good for you learning Hebrew. Okay. Uh, next, Athanasius. So we're going to hit Arianism here. We hit uh, Praxius. We hit modalism with Tertullian. Um, and there are others addressing that too. But he really went after it. He went after both Marcion and um, the Gnostic, and he went after uh, um, Praxius. Um, and uh, he was a lawyer, and so he he knew how to write um, very well. But he's he's a little bit, and you see this from time to time. He was one that was uh, he gets sort of labeled as uh, as not being very friendly in his writing. Can I say it that way? No. Well, Athanasius is at times. I was talking about Tertullian, the one we just talked about. Athanasius is not shy about, um, about uh, um, calling what he sees as a spade a spade. In fact, he has the audacity at one point to call the emperor the Antichrist. So, um, what did the emperor do in response? <laughs> oh, he got exiled a few times. Athanasius did. Um, but here's his on the incarnation. So Arianism, there was a time when the sun was not when he was brought into existence. Uh, 325 Nicaea, Nicene Creed, uh, addresses that heresy. In fact, declares, this is the way you must say it. If not, you're out of the church. Um, Constantine the emperor helped to engineer that, that council that came together to write the creed. Um, and everybody signed it on the way out because they knew if they didn't sign it, they were in trouble with the emperor. That wasn't a good thing to be even though some didn't, didn't agree with it. So you have, beginning with Nicaea, you have about 60 years of, of argument over, is that really the confession that we should have in the church over a number of issues? But anyway, here's Athanasius. And so he's just a presbyter under Alexander, who's the bishop of Alexandria, head of one of the big church scenes. Alexander dies shortly after the creed. Athanasius becomes the Bishop of Alexandria. And he writes uh, two treatises. This is, this is one of them. They're two paired treatises. This is the second one, On the Incarnation. They go together because you see at the end of the first one, it flows right into the second one. Um, and On the Incarnation, he never mentions Arius. He never mentions Arianism. But it's shortly after that creed has been written. And so this is my, my estimation of it. Is this is a... This is for the believers a explanation of, of what, what happened at, at Nicaea, an explanation of that theology of the Son. And uh, he consistently throughout uses word. So word is God the Son. He consistently uses that more than any other thing, more than wisdom, more than Son. He uses word. Um, and... Uh, and that is intentional because 
no one can disagree with word being divine. So he's intentional in his, in, in his, in his extreme use of that. But he uses other, the other, uh, other terms for the, for the son in scripture as well. For the word, perceiving that no otherwise could the corruption of man be undone, save by death as a necessary condition, while it was impossible for the word to suffer death, being immortal, so he's God the Son and Son of the Father, so he, he cannot die. To this end, he takes himself a body capable of death, that it, by partaking of the word who is above all, might be worthy to die instead of all, and might, because of the word which has come to dwell in it, might remain incorruptible, is resurrected. And that, and that thenceforth corruption might be stayed from all by the grace of the resurrection. So this is just one little snippet from this on the incarnation. It's all about his, um, his arguing, why did Christ become, why did he take on human flesh on the incarnation? Um, and so uh, this is the beginning of his life's work of addressing Arianism. Again, he doesn't mention it here. He's simply given an in instruction to the church um, about uh, why, did, why did Christ take on human flesh? And he's making an argument for salvation. He ties everything about the incarnation to salvation. Um, as has been a regular practice for, uh, for others that came before him. So up on top you see uh, that little thing on top is the Nicene Creed. So the Nicene Creed, uh, who, which he helped to contribute to in some ways before it was written, influenced him uh, to, to continue throughout his whole life, for the rest of his life, to defend this truth about God the Son. I'll skip these, um, but this is just more citations from On the Incarnation. Um, well, so I mentioned that that uh, 57 year, uh, 56 year process where there were a whole bunch of creeds written, a whole bunch of councils met, disagreeing with one another. Um, the Nicene Creed actually got buried for a while, um, but Athanasius kept making the case for it. Finally, we get to Constantinople 381. This is after Athanasius has passed, and Constantinople writes the definitive creed um, for defending Nicene theology and adding to it things that were necessary, including uh, a, a narrative of what what uh, Christ did and accomplished. So all the yellow words are words that were added to the Nicene Creed in this. We've read the first one, that, that brief statement about, uh, about Christ, and that here for us humans, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, became fully human. He's not only addressing Arianism here, but he's going back and, and ensuring that this captures or not he, but the council, the council, that it captures things that were necessary to address before. So you're putting all the boundaries around, around uh, Christ's deity and Trinitarianism in this confession. This becomes the confession that people say, okay, this is it. This addresses every heresy that's come before us, although there's more coming. Um, became fully human. For, his, for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. He rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. So here it is. The entire church agrees with this. You've now got east and west um, in the empire. Churches agreeing, this is our confession over a long labor to get to this language and to make sure that the boundaries around the truth about God the Son are there, are in there, except for one thing uh, that we'll hit next. King will have no end. Um, so then the, uh, um, the last false teaching 
is two natures. How do you explain that he's fully God and fully man? Okay, we agree on that, but how do you explain it? And here we go again where there's attempts to break the tension, right? Because it's impossible for a person <laughs> walking the planet to be fully God and fully man. That's impossible. We can't imagine that's true. How does that work? Um, and so here's Apollinarianism. This, by the way, came up prior to Constantinople. Apollinarius was actually a colleague of Athanasius. And Athanasius had to kind of deal with that issue. So he wrote something about that uh, to try and distance himself. Um, but it was late in his life and it's not a really a great writing, but it's a good attempt. Um, here's what Apollinarius believed. He thought that Christ incarnate had a divine mind, not a human mind or a human soul, but a human body. So it's celestial humanity joined with flesh. It's God in a bod. You want to put it that way. So this is in the late fourth century. Um, the uh, Constantinople addresses it. He gets, he gets uh, excommunicated uh, for, uh, for his confession. Um, but here's where the struggle is beginning. So they've addressed his deity. Now they're beginning to wrestle with, and those that were in that period start to think about, okay, how does that actually work? And naturally you've got insiders in the church, the ones we're gonna look like, they're all insiders, who are trying to, who are trying to break, pop the bubble, break the, break the tension, um, reconcile it. This was the first one. Uh, Nestorianism. Mary, being mortal, could not birth God. She was not the Theotokos, the mother of God. She bore the human Christ, and he became the vessel that housed God. So Nestorius argues for a separation of the two natures. Mary gave birth to a son, then the son took on, uh, um, Jesus took on deity. So it happened afterwards, not during the birth. Um, right, yeah. No, yeah. And so that's in the fifth century. One more, Eutychianism. The two natures fused together and became one. Only way you can explain two natures, there can't be two separate natures. That's impossible. Uh, a person only has one nature. Um, and so they fused together and became one. That's hard to believe in two full natures. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness they're all just trying to figure it out, though. We've got no one we've gotten with this, right? Yeah. So there are a few people out there who are trying to figure it out, and they are on the wrong track. So here's what happens. You have, um, you're, now, now the, 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 the way to deal with these is councils, right? You have people that, that argue against it, and then finally they've got to come together and, okay, we have to address this. Um, and so you had Apollinarius addressed at Constantinople, but the next two, they're tougher because you've got strong church insiders. Both Nestorius and Eutychius were respected and they had allies in different parts of the church. And so this, these become a big deal. So you actually have two councils that happen. You have first, you have the Council of Ephesus and they address Nestorianism. Uh, but, uh, uh, that's not enough. Then you've got to move on and address this other one, Eutychius. And finally, Chalcedon. After a series of, of attempts to try and quash these, and then Ephesus comes up with an address. And finally, Chalcedon, 451. Um, and there's been a lot of people involved in trying to address these things. And they write their Chalcedonian, it's at, they actually called it a definition because... Nicene is the creed. They're just, they're just supplementing that creed to address this particular heresy. But that's the creed. They really mean the one at Constantinople, but they say Nicaea. So here it is. Following them, the Holy Fathers, we unite in teaching all men 
to confess the one and only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So they're going back to, when they say Holy Fathers, they're going back to the apostles, but they're also going to those who wrote the Nicene Creed. They're now Holy Fathers. That council, is a council was a council of Holy Fathers. Athanasius planted that seed uh, in his late defense, but now they're carrying it on. And what else they're doing is saying, hey, we had the baton passed to us by them. So we're addressing this heresy. Uh, we died in teaching uh, all men to confess the one only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the self same one is perfect in both deity and also in humanity. So there's no confusion, there's no separation. Um, this self same one is all, also truly God and truly man. Matt Ball taught me to use that, that word with a rational soul and a body. Um, so he has full humanity, true humanity. He's of the same essence as the Father as far as deity concerned, um, and of the same essence as we are ourselves as far as humanity concerned, which means he's just fully human, not saying that, he's, that we all share an essence. He's, they're not saying that. It can, you can read it like that, but that was, that, that, that's not their intention. Thus, like us in all respects, sin only accepted. Before time began, he was begotten of the Father in respect of his deity. And now in these last days, for us in behalf of our salvation, the self same one was born in Mary the Virgin, who is God-bearer. So they're bringing that term in that um, Eutyches kicked out, or, or Nestorius kicked out, in respect of his humanity. We also teach that we understand this one and only Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, in two natures. And we do this without confusing the two natures, without mixing one nature into the other, without dividing them into two separate categories. So they're, they're addressing all the things that were being said that were untrue. They're, they're putting the boundaries on very clearly for each of those, each of those false teachings. Um, now what makes it challenging is when you read the scriptures, how do you do that? Knowing that you must always, no matter what he says or does, uh, remind yourself that he's fully God, truly God, and truly man in everything he does once he's incarnate. Without separating them according to area or function, the distinctiveness of each nature is not nullified by the union. Instead, the properties of each nature are conserved and both natures concur in one identity and in one person. So he doesn't become less deity because of his humanity. He doesn't become less human because of his deity. They are not divided or cut in two, but are together the one and only begotten word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So now you have two huge mysteries. You have one God in three persons. You have the incarnate Son of God, truly God and truly man, and things that you can't come up with an analogy of, the true mysteries, but absolutely necessary for our salvation. Um, and then they say, thus the pro have the prophets of old testified. Thus the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us. Thus the symbol of the fathers is handed down to us. They're saying, okay, we have this, we have this legacy that we must defend and protect. We didn't come up with this. This is what you read in the scriptures. This is what Christ confessed about himself and demonstrated about himself. This is what those that came after him carefully thought about and expressed and taught, told true to that truth. Um, it's not the end of the day because there are those who are gonna disagree with Chalcedon. You have a couple of offshoots of people who disagree and actually a schism that happens in the church because some say, no, we disagree with that part of it, we're gonna separate. And that happens for a short time, then they reconcile. But, um, but here you have it. These are the confessions that we still hold to today. You go to Constantinople, you go to Chalcedon, you say, we still confess these to be true. Uh, 
one nature, three persons, that's a trinity. One person, two natures, that's the incarnate Son of God. Um, and the one and only Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten in two natures, without confusion, without mixture. The two don't mix together and operate that way. Without division, they're not separate. Um, without separation. So there are the boundaries for our theology. Here's another picture of that that has the two together. You got the Trinity, the things outside the box are things that we say, no, that's not true. Um, and then inside the box, uh, you have Christology, the one person, two natures with those four things, right? So real quick, we're over time, I know, but uh, just uh, some implications. Read the Bible with particular Christ-centered focus. Um, and we talked about there's pointers in the Old Testament that point to the, the coming of, the, of God the Son incarnate. But some people are tempted to find it everywhere. Find things where they say, oh, well, yeah, that's an example of it. Oh, well, there's an example of it. Just be careful with that. Um, Second, read the gospel with awareness that Jesus Christ is truly God, not just man, and vice versa. So think about when you read the gospels, what do you think more of? Do you think more of his humanity? Or do you think more of his deity? Or do you think of both? There's a, um, there was a work written, and it happened uh, during the time of Chalcedon by, by uh, Augustine. And Augustine gives pointers on how to read the gospels in light of his deed in humanity. Okay, and he goes to particular verses and, and categorizes them on, okay, best way to think about that in this verse is this. Best way to think about it in this verse is that. So he made a noble attempt. I don't agree with everything he said, but he was working through the helping, helping the church um, hold this truth as they're reading the scriptures. And then um, since we've encountered a lot of false teachings um, and things that are attempts to try and reconcile the mystery. Um, it's important to listen to how the world speaks about Jesus, that we hear it in our day, um, and, uh, and think about how we should respond, especially for those you're close to, right? And don't neglect um, um, that uh, it is important to disciple those in this truth about the Trinity, about uh, the Incarnation, about God the Son. All right. Any further, any other questions? Any other thoughts? We've made it through. Define begotten, because it sounds like God the Father came first. I know he didn't create. I'm not reading begotten. If you read it like begot him, then it's like at one point he didn't have him. But if you read it like begotten, like he's only, like he only has, he could have always had, but it's, you know, it's yeah. like it's, I think begotten, it's, what's the new word that they translated? Begotten is give birth to, isn't it? The fucking soul. Well, well it's, it's, a, again, it's a translation, Jesus though. Did not, uh, God the Son didn't always exist, but he always existed. So how is he begotten? Yeah. Well, it's it's uh, clarified as eternally begotten. Um, and But that doesn't mean that he's still in the womb waiting to come out somehow. Is there a way you can use the same begotten in a non-God-the-Father-God-the-Son um, sentence? Is there something else? Or we can so, talk at home. So Jesus is the only begotten in, in the Greek as the, the monogenes. Yeah, mon mm, yep, that's the word. Birth, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what is that word? Yeah, 
right. uh, of priority or, or opinion. So it's, so it's the monogamous in Greek is equivalent to the Hebrew of the, the most primary. Which is why the Pharisees always got mad about Jesus calling himself the Son of God because that made the people right. they didn't really appreciate that. Begotten by definition is, uh, especially when man brings a child into existence by the process of reproduction, which yeah. I'm just, which you, doesn't. Which is an angle for it. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can Google the Septuagint where, where it translates begotten and then the Hebrew with it. I can't remember what the word is. Yeah. But it, it doesn't carry. Because if you it's think not about the same it, then, then and that, that's the what what son's like. not. But I know it's says eternal begotten. Yeah, because that's what begotten would mean. It primarily carries the connotation of actual physical birth. But with the Septuagint, the word that doesn't mean physical birth is primarily okay. connotation of that. That's why we use in English begotten instead of born. Because it's old timey enough to where, hey, maybe we're talking about something different. Except when they used it or first translated it, was it old timey? Well, now they use the Greek. But it's using oh, it's. That's why it hasn't been up, quote unquote, updated to to a, a more yeah. It uses it intentionally to to for that eternal relationship, yeah. right of the of the persons. Yeah, because it implies and, that God the Father was before, but we know that nope. He wasn't. Which is why there are some culturally around today that are very numerous. Who believe that there is God and there's Son and there's right. uh, But you're yeah, but you're Arius and you start with Hebrews, I don't know, you start with uh, Proverbs eight twenty two, where wisdom was brought into the world, right? That's and that's a mistranslation of the Hebrew to for him. Not everybody in that day was reading the Hebrew. Most of them reading reading Greek translation of the Old Testament even. So that's that's problematic. Um, yeah, you bet. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't going to name anybody specifically because I wasn't sure, but yeah, that's what I had in mind. With Elohim and Jesus and Satan were brothers. Oh, Lord. But once you find a. Once you find a hook somewhere in Scripture, you can build a theology from it. You can you can do that to interpret Scripture in that way. So, yeah. What's next week? Next week, I believe, is we're going to talk about salvation. I believe I can believe. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we're tying the next couple of weeks to God the Son. That's the plan. Then we'll hit God the Spirit. Oh, we're also going to... Somebody asked me about this. Are you going to talk about the resurrection? We do have a week on hope, so we're going to hit that too. So, All right. Thanks, y'all.